Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's part number two of Day 9 Daily number 476, where we learn to be a better gamer. Um, oh, this, is, this is the wrong time to lose my train of thought. I came on uh, to the show and I immediately looked at this sweet pocket watch that my friend Eric gave me. Look how cool this pocket watch is. That's awesome, right? Look, it even has like a little gear on it. And it works too. It's so cool. And I literally looked at it and was like, oh, that's so sweet. And I was like, oh my god, I'm live. All right, let me actually get to the show content. All right, cool. Let's do this. So, in part number one, we talked quite a bit about the idea of transitioning. How even though we have a brilliant game plan and we're executing very well, which is literally what Liquid Rhett did, if we have a weak link in that transition, our opponent can bust through it, or I guess burst through it is grammatically correct, and then we die, and dying is our enemy. Cool. So what I want to do is take some of those ideas of transitioning and apply them here to this mutilisk zergling style that we're going to see Rhett perform in parts two and three. The essential thing to note about mutiling is that it's really hard to both get into mutiling and then to pop out of it again. Let me talk about the popping out for a moment. God, for some reason I can only think about belly buttons right now. Why am I so juvenile? Fuck. Okay, let's do a show. In terms of the stopping Ling Mutalisk, I'm sure that a lot of you have started to go Ling Muta, and then you just only go Ling Muta, and you never stop going Ling Muta. You just keep building it and counterattacking here and there. You're going to counter, and we're going to just try to kill him with Ling Muta. All right, you just keep doing it. And I'd honestly say that even at high master, low grandmaster level, that works. It works really well. It's hard for Protosses to be able to manage that much space at once unless they're just good, solid all around. However, when you start to get to the super Gosu grandmasters, they'll do things like defend very calmly, get storm, and perform excellent counterattacks, especially with the warp prism. And this can cause real headaches for someone if they have 40 mutalisks and nothing else. Have you ever gotten your mutapack vortexed? Yeah, that feels like shit. It feels terrible. That's oh, there's not even a joke at the end of that. It's a, just a horrible thing that happened. So, um, yeah, so obviously we don't want to do that. But also there's this added problem of when we stop going mutalisks, there's a real inability to put pressure on our opponent. You know, if you have 10 mutas and he has five stalkers, cool, he's contained. But then when you get 15 mutalisks, now he has 10. And then when you get 25 mutalisks, now he has 17 stalkers. And it becomes, it's kind of like a, an arms race where you're both increasing the numbers. And if one of you stops, like if you stop mutalisk production, then, then you can start attacking with the stalkers. So you have to be really aware of that. Um, and likewise, the getting into mutalisks is a little bit easier to talk about we have to have some way to not die in the early game, and most importantly, uh, to put at least some pressure back on him. So we're going to see Rhett accomplish a lot of that in this game. And I want to emphasize what the junctures are in, the, in, this, in this little sport that we shall see in this Zag versus Zag. Hmm. Ah. Uh. Oh, let me let me let me note something um, as well. If you start going Ling Muta and never stop Ling Muting for the rest of the game, it's you do have trouble against those really good Grandmaster players. But it's not like you just die all of a sudden. Um, if, for instance, if you went one base Roach and your opponent held it off and you just kept building Roaches, you would eventually just die because it's not a very strong follow up build kind. Of kind of thing. So, um, obviously players like Demaga, I see popping up a lot in chat. Demaga's totally done this mass, 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 mass mutalisk style. But even Demaga, his games demonstrate this difficulty of even transitioning to things like Infestors, Broodlords. Getting a lot of spine crawlers seems to be the only real technique that a lot of those type mutilinging players have done. So, Let's speed it up a bit. Liquid Rhett. He goes hatch. He goes pool. It's a little greedy, but Rhett's a greedy player. He always takes metagame risks, but not really in a risky way. Sase loves going Nexus first, which is what we see Sase doing. 
And look at this badass Sase. He's getting double gas before cannon. Aww, yeah. All right, come on, Rickwood Rhett. There he is, going for a third hatch. Now let's just start making the statements that we always make. Our first transition is from this expanding droning player to a unit building defending player. How do these transitions work? Well, don't worry, the StarCraft community is committed to months and years and many millennia of research to discover that double gassing close to six minutes is an excellent time to build your two gas geysers. And then you build no more gas geysers for quite some time. You actually go Roach, Warren, and Evolution Chamber around seven, sometimes a little later if you get your layer first, sometimes a little earlier if you get your layer later. So Rhett getting his layer early, getting his spawning pool early on as well. And interestingly, has completely skipped this Roach transition. Oh my gosh, wait a minute. Oh. So this is something that I kind of, <laughs> I guess, cheated and just sort of dropped in there that, you know, getting the gas geysers around six minutes, very typical to do your roach linging sort of thing, especially if you are starting to get worried about um, dying. You have to get the, the roach worn up around seven minutes, especially against a lot of those vicious warp gate aggressions. But we see Rhett hasn't done that. What What's up? What went wrong? Well, now, gee, let's, we can think of this transition as the same way as we were thinking about our other transitions. If I stop right here, we can see that literally at 10 minutes is when the Spire is done. And for any of you who are not familiar, the Mutalus takes about half a minute to build. I think it is 42 seconds on that sucker as well. So, Rhett has to figure out some way to stay alive until around 11 minutes. Around 11 minutes. Notice how we're keeping this rule of transitioning the same. I'm going to come back here to the six minute mark. Right here when we've taken our double gas. Already at the six minute mark, we know with Zerg that we need to stay alive till the 11 minute mark in order to get our mutalisks up, to begin to have made use of our transition. So let's see how Liquid Rhett does this. First of all, he sees these two gas geysers down. This is almost always a sign that our opponent is not going for a really early timing aggression. This can often indicate to us, oh yeah, oh, I can actually go straight for a layer and then wait a little bit on the Roach Warren and the Evo Chamber. Totally fine choice. Overlord from Rhett continues to poke in here, just kind of seeing what's up. Just kind of controlling the front. We see some sentry immortal action. All right, cool. Now, I'll ask a question right now at the eight minute mark. What are attacks that could have come at this point already? Really fast warp gate attacks could be that, but we've already crossed those off. Cool. Really fast stargates attack, stargate attacks could have happened. Well, looks like we have some queens up for that. We actually are a little bit low on queens. If we lost to an air attack around 8.30 or 9, you just started making air units and overran us and we died, what adjustment would we follow up and make? I'm just going to state it right out there. I'm just going to throw out this idea. Again, we haven't even begun to think about mutilus. That happens at 11 minutes. We're thinking about staying alive. What if we died to some sort of airplay on the ladder. What's a good way to respond to that? Well, why not just, instead of building Roach and Evolution Chamber, why not just build Evolution Chamber at around seven minutes? Start a plus one upgrade, and if he goes air, you build Spore Crawlers. Cool, all right, nice. I wanna emphasize that all we're doing as a learning organism is just stating um, this is the moment I'm trying to get to, the transition period, at 11 minutes is when I stay alive, and I'm just going to let the losses come to me. Oh, I'm losing to air at 9 minutes? I keep losing to air at 9 minutes? I guess I better build an Evo Chamber at 8 minutes. <sighs> Easy peasy. Cool. Alright, so I'll also ask, what is another very popular timing push time for Protoss? 9 minutes and 30 seconds. Or more broadly, just 10 minutes. 10 minutes is a nice timing attack time. So, 
Rhett does a smart maneuver. He checks this area at nine minutes. Nine minutes he checks this. I'm going to throw out a mysterious question. Why is nine minutes so important if ten minutes is a typical timing push time? All right, I'm looking at you, chat. Oh my god, people are talking about Legend of Korra in the chat. Oh god, I love Legend of Korra. So good. <sighs> what are they doing? People are saying things uh, because of 7, 8, 9. I like this. People are saying because you have one minute to pre prepare. Great. Oh, there's the one. Chat, 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 chat. Cool, yeah. A spine crawler takes 50 seconds to build. So if we have some sort of freaking emergency, like we go here and there's no expand, and then we wander up here and see a huge push coming, we have a minute of time to flood with a bunch of spine crawlers. So like we see this little little push coming, Rhett is just poking and prodding and looking around, and because he sees nothing going on, droning going on. What if he saw a huge push incoming? Can easily build a bunch of spines and that sort of thing. But fortunately, since he took a third, we can rely quite a bit on our counter attacks. Which unfortunately are not as effective because Sase is just really damn good. So excellent, we made it to our transition period. We're desperately trying to get to 11 minutes, and by the way, Immutalist takes, oh, 33 seconds. Oh, it doesn't take 42 seconds, excellent. Oh, that's the Corruptor, I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being so dumb. The Corruptor, look at him, he's 40 seconds. And now suddenly, we are in the thick of things with our Mutalist King. We're getting our Muta upgrade, we're building them Mutas. Harassing as best we can. And this is a pretty simple period. Now, I, I feel like a lot of people feel this in-game, but it might not be talked about. There's that feeling of... Uh, and then that feeling of, okay, cool, I'm all right, I'm really good. And this will almost always correlate to periods where you're transitioning, feel really... Uh, and then the periods after you've gotten whatever you're going for up, where you're like, okay... Uh, ever done a Dark Templar rush? It's scary until the Dark Shrine's done, and then you have invisible fucking units killing him. Ah, that sort of thing. Uh, with the Mutalisk players, this uh, building spine crawler and then cancel it. Okay, okay, okay. Now I have Mutalisk. Ah, oh. I want you to just start being aware of that like feeling that you have in game, because this will really highlight where the weak points are in your play and where the strong points are. The weak point, obviously, is being able to get these Mutas up. Now this part is the fun part. This is the easy one. Oh no! Why don't you guardian shield your sentries? I'm sure that'll help you withstand the might of many mutalisks. Where did your energy go? Ain't no purple in your army anymore! Smack him down, liquid rep. Taking him out. Now, I'll note back home, there's not that much amazing stuff going on. I mean, sure we're building drones and we're expanding and doing this sort of stuff. But we're just getting upgrades for Mutalane. Getting upgrades for Mutalane. Yeah. Cool. And we're continuing to Harris. Now, I'll stop right now and note at around here, I guess. Yeah, we got 70 drones out. Okay, cool. Uh, I kind of wish this timing lined up with the end of part number two so it could leave you with some things to think about. But instead, I'm going to go get some more ice water and leave you with this question. All right, Liquid Rat has just gone mutiling. He wants to stop going mutiling and tech to hive. I'll just give you that information because, well, maybe you've cheated too and you watched <laughs> Summer Dream Hack. We've just stated that outright. How does Liquid Rat do that? How does he do that? Let me tilt this up a bit. As I rise to get more water. Now consider this, does he does he transition to roaches and start building a lot of roaches? Maybe hell, even hydralisks. Does he just go for the hive first and then back up and get the infestors? Do we get the infestors first? What is that sort of thing? It's an interesting question.
that freaking fascinating? I like already without looking at the chat, I can tell you that there's a million and one things going on. Let's see some things. Let's see some things. We hear Infestor Spine is great. Infestor Spine to stall. Infestor's Ling's Mutas. Um, continue to go. Continue to go. Just yeah, a lot of Ling Muta type suggestions. I think the the one of the most important considerations is how the minerals get spent. I really like what Liquid Ret does in this circumstance. It's similar, it's quite similar to what we saw in the last transition. In the transition that kind of didn't work that we saw in part one. Now, th this sort of harassment with the Ling Mutalisk, I'm not actually talking that much about the positioning with it. Because I think that positioning your units and attacking with them can end up being pretty intuitive. Uh, it can actually be really fun to just play Ling Muta a lot and do this sort of stuff. This is just totally awesome. Now, if you've been looking up here, what you're noticing is that Liquid Red is actually going Drone Mutalisk. That's his little stepping stone segment. He's going Drone Mutalisk. And sure, Sase is pinned back. And we're seeing some really cool battles go on. But Drone Mutalisk, look, still going Drone Muta. At 91 drones, we have another 9 coming. Okay, now we're getting the Infestation Pit. This is a pretty cool transition play by Ren. This was actually, I think, one of the sweeter transitions ever. If we're building a ton of drones, we're obviously going to be going for a lot of spine crawlers. Um, compositionally, minerals onto drones, gas into mutas uh, and upgrades. It's really sweet. And because of the fact that Spines only take a minute to build. We can get a lot of them out. We have 98 freaking drones up. And because we are continuing to build just Mutalisks, we're continuing to build just Mutalisks, we're going to be able to keep the pressure up. I'll, I'll state outright that we do have at least a minute or two of time before we're actually feeling under threat. But what I like is that the instant Liquid Ret gets this infestation pit up, I just want to note, the same timing issue is going to happen. 100 seconds for a hive, and if we build our, oopsie daisies, if we build our Greater Spire at the same time, that's also 100 seconds. So again, 200 seconds to turn this into a Greater Spire right now. And then the other 40 seconds while the Broodlords are building, if we decide to go Hive right now, literally right now at 14 minute mark, what does that mean? It means we we need to stay alive till 18 minutes. That's the long period. This is the danger spot in the game. Just as it was in last game, where it was four full minutes. So what I like is the instant Liquid Rat decides that he does indeed want to go for the that Hive, want to go for those Brood Lords, then he gets the Roach Warren. This is such a cool transition. There's Liquid Red tearing down some cannons like a Zerg man, distracting the Protoss Sase. There's Sase trying to blink under the Mutalisks, successfully not killing one. Oh, see ya. So sweet. We have 107 drones right now. We're getting some Ling and Fester up. We have our Roach worn up and up. We're trying to do harassment. Oh, wow, we started this hive when? 14 minutes? Jeez, we need to get to 18 freaking minutes. And Rhett is starting to just really aggressively rush for all this kind of defense stuff. I think this is the period where people will start to go in Fester and then go hive, and the attack will come at around 17, 1730. I mean, we're already seeing that we can't quite break into the Protoss base. I mean, Sase's just doing a phenomenal job shutting it down. This is what happens when you play against really good, good, good players. But he's just starting to mass him up, and he's just going Drone Infestor Spine. Now, I'll note, in the last push that we saw, like the push last game, where Rhett ended up losing, Rhett was not building this many spines this early. We actually see the attack force just now coming out, and Rhett is almost done with this giant wall of spines. We even have the contingency plan roaches. Should there start to be any sort of big threat, we just mass roach it up. We see even more spine crawlers going down. 
it's almost the same transition that we saw last game, except instead of roaches and lings buying us time, it's mutalisks buying us time. And look at how delightful this period is as well. Where Rhett is harassing, he's not bombing and like floating his way in. He's actually just lightly pressuring while he has this ultra stable setup back home. He's already gotten a lot more infestors, seven more about to pop out, 42 lings about to pop out, and just oodles and oodles and oodles of spine crawlers. The one thing I would note before we step onto part three is that these mutalisks um, do have the luxury of being able to return home to battle much, much more easily than a roachling counterattack force. That's one of the big deal sealers of this all, is that if you go for roach counterattack and he just decides that he's going to base race you, it's kind of hard to pull those roaches all the way home. It's really easy to pull Mutilus all the way home. When we come back in part three, we're going to wrap this game up, admire Liquid Red just a little teensy bit more, and then we're just going to go away. We're just going to stop. We're just going to be like, enough, enough. And no, there's no spider on my wall. Stop saying it. Unless there's a spider on my wall. Oh shit, I hope there's not. Oh god, I hate spiders.